Now, at last time, we discussed the uh, um, classroom and the setting up of the classroom. Now, today, I thought I would like to discuss how we actually started class. And on Tuesday, I thought we ought to really have a discussion. We haven't had any discussion yet. And you must, all of you, have questions that you're wanting to ask. So on Tuesday, if you would all come with the questions you want to ask prepared, and that should be interesting, because everybody brings a different viewpoint. So I should be uh, expecting you to ask questions, and everybody to can join in and contribute answers, and so on. But today, we want to think about setting up a classroom. For the, now, when we say setting up, uh, starting a class, I do mean starting a new class, or starting a class where the majority of children are new to the class. Uh, that is a tricky thing, and it's, it's not so difficult to the way anyone would uh, start a new class. Once you have your class running smoothly, you can add new children no, you're only adding a few at a time. You don't have to make any special arrangements because the children are just absorbed into the group and you probably, or your helper, are having to give the new children some extra attention. But the, because all the group are happy and doing things happily, the new children feel very confident at once. You see, you have, but if you have a group of little children who are mainly all of them new, you see, then there is at first that slight feeling of insecurity because you may have several who feel insecure. So there are certain techniques that do help. Now, the, the, you have to prepare your environment differently. You can't have the Montessori materials out on the shelves because uh, if the children started using them as they would want to, they would misuse them, you see, and then it would take you uh, the rest of the year to get them, uh, to give the lessons and get undo what had been done wrong in the way of handling. So I think at first you would have all your Montessori materials in your stock cupboard outside the classroom. See? And the shelves where the Montessori materials are going to be kept should have nothing on them, because if you put other things on the shelves, then the children are confused when those things disappear and the Montessori materials appear. But you will, of course, have things for the children to do, and the things you will have will be things that the children can probably use without a lesson, things that you know and will attract them, and things they may already be familiar with in their own homes. But anything you have of course, must be absolutely safe. Uh, because you don't know your children. The kind of thing that is uh, useful, they love threading beads. All children love threading beads. They love putting things in holes. You know. And so you have large beads that can be threaded on a boot lace. The boot lace is absolutely safe. They can't in any way prick each other with it or prick their own fingers. So large beads that you could thread on a boot lace. I mean, you don't have to have these things. I'm just telling you the sort of things that would be useful. Uh, any of the fitting toys, there's some very nice ones on the market, ones that push together very easily. What do you call it here? Lego, yes, that is one. Lego is a good one. Quite small children like that. They're very little ones, just like pushing it together, fitting it together, and children, if you had four-year-olds, would be making models. That's a very nice one. Another one we have is made out of pieces of wood, different sizes and lengths, and the wood has holes. And for the nursery one, the holes uh, and this, these are put together with, with sticks of different lengths. And I really know small, the smallest dowels, you see. 
le uh, nearly actually nearly a, a centimeter in circumference uh, in diameter, <coughs> and they again they fit, put a stick a hole and then something else on the other end of the stick. Yes, it's rather nicer than that. And the holes and the pieces of wood are rather larger. But if, if you don't have that here, probably the Tinker Toy would be as good. All right. They're certain they love these fitting things. Another thing I found very successful is a large pegboard. You know what I mean by that. And you can get pegs, we can get plastic pegs in many colors. And you see a two and a half year old who spent ages trying to put the pegs in the holes. So not good finger exercise and something they really enjoy doing. So anything that you think the children will like. Uh, in that sort of line. And so, uh, again, a box of building bricks. Uh, the nicest building bricks are really made just from offcuts that are sandpapered, so that they do have different shapes and different sizes. I also found that it was a good idea to have some pieces of wood that needed sandpapering, because if I had four-year-old boys, they would just love to learn to sandpaper. So I always had a carpentry bench and a vise that they could put a piece of wood in and you have a block of wood and sandpaper, they hold it round the block, and they just expend all this energy on sandpapering the block down. And then it can be one that go into the brick box, or it can be used for a very simple model that can be nailed together. So that uh, does uh, your exuberant boys were like doing that. See. You have probably to provide for children between two and a half and and five, the ages you would be having, I think. I wouldn't myself ever have anything that makes a mess. I mean, you would avoid paints, you know, because if they get spilt, where well, you have to see that it's cleared up. I wouldn't. I didn't myself at first have uh, much in the way of uh, chalks and crayons because some people would scribble on the walls, you know. Nothing that can cause a disaster of that nature. If you have uh, colored pencils, then you have the ordinary ones with wood, you know, that they were just some plain paper. But not ones that will, uh, not the big uh, wax ones that they can scribble on anything with. Well, these things can be out on the tables, or you can have uh, a special place to keep them, you know, bring in a large table and have them on a large table or a special uh, shelf so the children can take what they fancy. Don't have anything that can be spilt. You have a vase of flowers, don't have it on a table because it will get knocked over. <coughs> well, anything that will attract them, which they will enjoy doing. And the room must look attractive. If you have an animal, I, I do find that uh, new children uh, like this very much. It must be a little furry animal is what they like, like a mouse or a hamster. Always has to be two mice there. They, they like companionship. The hamster doesn't mind. Uh, you can have two mice of the same sex, otherwise you get too many mice in no time. <laughs> <laughs> or a rabbit. You see, there must always be a very deep cage. The cage must be well locked. And there must always be an inner compartment so that the animal could escape and be absolutely safe. Because children who are not used to an animal, you see, don't know how to behave with it. And they might start poking at it with something. And whatever happens, Nothing must go wrong with the animal. If, if you can't look after the animal properly and take great care of the animal, then the children don't feel safe with you. I find that if they bring you in any little creature that's got lost, uh, you know, is like uh, 
once we had a child brought here, or more than once, they brought in this little baby bird, naked bird, uh, that's sort of just out of the ape and skull, onto the ground. It always means that the parent has tipped it out of the nest because there is something wrong with it. And in nature, they don't keep anything that can't survive on its own. You must always do your best, you see, to try and keep it alive. If it dies and that you've done your best, the children don't mind. But if you were to say, oh, that won't live, don't bring it in, then they would be upset with you. Actually, you can practically always do something. Um, first, the thing that creature must be kept warm if it's a baby bird. And we'd be very successful in bringing them up. Um, a tea cozy, something warm like that, so that the, it's like a nest. And then, uh, if you know what, you, you can't tell what it is usually. If you knew what the nest was, you might know more about how to feed it. Um, I usually found that if you chewed up chicken, you chew it up so it's nicely mixed with saliva. And they open their beaks and you can just pop it in. Mm -hmm. I've always found that anything like beef killed the bird at once. Yes, uh, and with a pigeon, we once had the, the work, work, people who were cutting a tree bring in a baby, a little pigeon. Uh, they feed from the parent's throat, so they won't open their mouths for you. And after trial and error, I found if I mushed up really good whole wheat bread with milk and held it in my hand like this, the, the creature would feed from my hand. And uh, it's very exciting if you can bring up one of these because you see the feathers develop and, you know, all the stages of development. Uh, the last little pigeon we brought up uh, stayed with us for about three years. I mean, it flew free as soon as it could fly, but you only had to go outside and call it and it would come. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the children like to go and hold out uh, corn or brown bread or something and it would come flying out of the sky, so that was a great excitement. Mm -hmm. uh, the little blackbird we brought up, we had to keep with us for life and build a cage in the garden because it had a crooked claw. So, but as long as you do your best for whatever it is, then the children have this uh, good feeling of security with you that you would do your best for them. But if you neglect an animal or let it get damaged in the classroom, then they become a little distrustful of you. Could you really look after them? See, so don't let an animal ever get hurt. Now, before school actually begins, uh, you should, you will of course see the parents and hopefully both parents before the child is enrolled and then you should have a form for them to fill in. Uh, but you, the form should ask any specific questions about the child as to whether the child has any allergies or any food problems. If there's anything you have to look out for in the medical line with that particular child. You must get that down on a form and the parents sign it because I have once or twice, even then, have been given a child, one I remember, who had convulsions occasionally, and we were not told, you see, because the parents were so afraid we wouldn't take the child if we were told. But and another child was uh, epileptic. It didn't happen often. But if you know, and the other children know it can happen, then it, it doesn't matter having one of these children. But it, it is worrying if it happens and you don't know. So any specialities or any specialities about the lavatory, what words they use, I don't know what it's like here, the great variety of ways of saying the same thing. But it's just as well if you know what that particular child does. So uh, you, ha you discuss anything uh, relevant to the child with the parents. It's better to have the parents, I think, without the child for this first visit. And, uh, you must tell them about the method you're using. And in fact, you might have a, a short written handout that they can read. 
So they know something about the method and uh, what they're getting, what they can expect. And then I think just before the child comes to school, it mustn't be long before, the week before, you have the classroom ready and you make an appointment with each mother or father, it doesn't matter which parent, to bring the child at a particular time to visit. And during this visit, you make friends with the child, you have the child by itself. You don't have other children there at the same time. So that you can concentrate on the child and the parent, and uh, particularly on the child, and you show the child some of the things that he'll be doing, like the pegboard or the beads, you see. You show him the score, you let him try a little chair. Uh, look at this. They love the ones with the little arms. You, know, you sit in this chair and see, see if that's a comfortable one, if you like it. So, and uh, you must be careful to show them the cloakroom and things like this, because that can be a worry to them if they don't know just where it is. So you show them the whole school and you make this good relationship so the child knows you. And then it, it takes about 20 minutes, you know, perhaps half an hour. And it's really worth it because the child knows you, he knows the environment. And then when you say goodbye, you explain to the child that the next time he comes, he'll be coming again to spend the day, mornings with you and that you have a lot of other children for him to play with. See, so he knows that the next time he comes, there will be other children. And I found if I do that, and make a, a good relationship with the child in that visit, that I almost never have any crying the first day. Children come in with this positive attitude. They go straight to something they have enjoyed using and want to use it again, you see. They probably take no notice of their mother. They don't even say goodbye. You know, she's a bit chattering for her. I think you need to explain to the mothers. You see, well, if your child is really, is really secure, if he's had a very uh, happy time with you in his first years, then he's a very trusting child, you see. And a sign of this trust, trust is that he will go to other people at three years of age, you see, which is the right best time to begin. Because they trust their mothers and their fathers and had this good uh, beginning, then they trust everybody. And they will go to a school situation without any trouble. I think it's uh, wise to tell the mothers and tell the mothers how the children will often just walk away and leave them when they're interested, you see. Because otherwise I've had many mothers feel very upset. Here have I looked after this child and here he'll run away from me, you see, without saying goodbye. It's a bad sign if the child clings to the mother and doesn't want to come in. See, if you have, it, it's, uh, it's not quite, uh, he's not had quite what he should have done. But again, I find it's wise to warn the mothers that something I find happens very often is the child comes very happily every day, for perhaps 10 days, two weeks, and for some unknown reason, he will then have a tearful spell. And nothing's gone wrong at school. It seems to be a sort of delayed action. And it doesn't last. And it's best then if the mother just brings him normally and says goodbye as quickly as possible. But it's, it's never anything that's gone wrong. It just seems to happen with a certain number of children. It's so regular that you begin to expect it. So it's as well the mother is warned about. I think children come in much more easily than they used to because they do, uh, families mix so much more than they used to do. You occasionally get trouble with a problem parent. Some mothers are possessive and they can't bear to part with their children, you see. Um, I once had a father who wept every day on saying goodbye to his daughter. <laughs> It was a bit more difficult. <laughs> Just didn't have the same. I, I didn't have the same sympathy. I, I, I mean, you know, it's really hard. You can say comforting things to a mother. It's not so easy when there's somebody twice as large as you. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, so um, in that case if there's any difficulty in the party you always invite the mother in and you always give her a chair and a table and you always give, ask her to stay there not walk about and interfere with the other children and you, you give her nice things on the table for the child you see and she comes and she stays with the child every morning until he's ready to leave her now, you must not have this false separation I don't know how it is here. Do you have most of your children come in easily? Or you haven't had the experience yet? I think they come in much more easily than they used to. When my daughter first started working, it was a brand new Montessori school, and the teacher passed them. Instead of the mother sitting with the children, she would sit with the children and teach them the story of the Montessori. Yes, but wherever you are, there's a separation. And that, to me, would be very difficult because you have to stay in the parking lot when you should be in the schoolroom yourself, you see. And uh, I think, myself, I wouldn't care for that because the children like to know that their mothers see the schoolroom. And again, if any mother invites you to go to her home, I would always accept because once you've been to a child's home, they feel that you're part of the home and they're very happy with you. You get a different relationship. So I, would, I wouldn't ever have this difficulty in parting myself. Is I do say to the mothers, it's better if they leave quickly, because sometimes they hang about. I mean, they're interested in seeing what happens, but if they hang about, the children begin to feel uncertain. See, why is that mother hanging about like this? There must be something up quite right, or she wouldn't stay like that. So it's better if the mothers leave quickly. If a child should really cry after the mother's gone, and you, it's usually, it, you, you, you're usually able to make him happy, I find it's best to take him out of the classroom and special him somewhere else, take him around the garden or take him to another room. Because if one child starts crying, then the others start crying. <laughs> <laughs> Sketching. So, and also it means that you can mother him by himself. He may be a bit overwhelmed with all these children. So in the school in London, I was always about on the first days. So that if there was any trouble, I could take the child somewhere else, and we would make a good relationship until he was ready to come into the class. And then I'd be there for a little bit with him and leave when he was ready. But you mustn't let a child cry. You must always do something. And if you couldn't make him happy, then you might telephone the mother to come and sit with him, you see, until he was uh, cross happy. Of course, I think uh, uh, the trouble is that so many children are being left too young. You see, you're not meant to separate from your mother at two. Perhaps at two and a half, you may be ready. But uh, again, if you have uh, your home in a, is a small apartment, it may be better for you to spend some of the time in a nursery school. But in the big towns, the homes are not always suitable for children. Now, you must also have ready for the first day uh, group lessons. You treat the children more as a group than you will do later. So you have uh, plenty of things that you could do with them prepared. See? They love any sort of form of music. If you play some instrument that you can look at the children while you're playing it, uh, they like singing. See? They might like some free moving to music. They might like a very simple story with pictures. So, and then uh, you are always ready to change the activity as soon as uh, the children get a little restless, because they may not have the same attention span that they will have later. See? And the lesson doesn't always go quite the way you mean it to go. <coughs> the singing can turn into movement and so on. 
but you have things ready. And perhaps you might, from the first day, introduce something in the way of practical life. If it was the summer with us, you might, uh, we might take in a whole lot of peas. Do you, you know, do you, you have peas here, I expect? You have to shell them. And the children just adore shelling peas. You know, they won't get many shelled, and they may get some eaten. <laughs> but uh, they will enjoy being around the big table all together and helping you with that. And if it's a group lesson and somebody stays <coughs> playing with the pegboard, that, well, that doesn't matter. As long as they're occupied happily, that's all that does matter. And if you, they have enjoyed shelling the peas, they would expect to have it the next day and the next day. So you can shell peas for two or three mornings. And uh, then after that, you could have some peas on the side that they could shell individually. They might like a lesson very early on in something collective like brass polishing or polishing silver. You all sit around the big table, do it together. And when you had a few group lessons, then the material comes into the classroom and is kept on the practical life shelf where they can help themselves to it. So gradually you will begin introducing practical life exercises. Well, not just about the first day. Uh, you must uh, be yourself very calm and collected, whatever happens, you know? Uh, you mustn't rush around in an agitated way, you know, it's very easy to start feeling that it's too much for you. You expect it to be noisy. You expect things to get upset. You see, somebody is bound to knock the pegs over and scatter them over the floor, you see. But it's nice for everyone to help pick them up, and that takes a little while. <laughs> and uh, so don't worry that the room is, gets very untidy, that the children are much noisier. They will begin to make friends with each other. You can also, from the beginning, have some exercises for the control of movement. You could get all your children sitting in a semicircle, and you could demonstrate to them the right way to pick up a chair. See, with one hand uh, at the back of the seat, and one hand in the front, and demonstrate the right way to carry a chair. And then uh, you could invite anyone in the group to, to pick up their chair and carry it. And always pick on an extrovert, you know. Uh, Tommy, would you like to show us how you pick up a chair? You will carry it across the room and bring it back. You see? And they enjoy doing this. And then from then on, you have that exercise on the following day so they all learn the right way to carry a chair. Nobody gets uh, poked. Then uh, you could also, another time, very soon, show them how you could, uh, you'd all listen. Very quiet. I'm going to pick up my chair. I'm going to put it down. You won't hear anything. You listen now. And you demonstrate how you can pick up a chair and put it down without any noise at all. Now that was you didn't hear anything. Who's going to who's going to try and pick up their chair? And who's going to put their chairs <coughs> down so quietly that we can't hear any noise? And you, by this time, you know which is uh, the real extrovert. Oh, Johnny's going to do it. We'll all listen to Johnny. Mm -hmm. See? And this is something they enjoy doing. But also, it calls their attention to noise. And you find that they begin being quieter in the classroom. You can make, uh, put a few chairs fairly near each other and they can walk in and out of the chairs in a line, trying not to touch the chairs or the tables. So they begin to move around the classroom without knocking into every bit of furniture. 
these kind of exercises are very enjoyable, but it also gets the children to begin to move quietly, to carry things quietly, to see to walk around without bumping into things. So any of those exercises are good for the first things. <coughs> You will naturally have at least one aide with you, because I think, I'm not sure, what are the proportions of children to adults in California? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Teacher, 50, a teacher and an aide to every 15, is that right? I think the teachers were 15 and is for how many children can you put with one teacher and an aide? Do you know? Depends on the age, but to this age, so two and a half to five. You can have about 20, I think, per teacher. Or maybe that's two teachers. No, I think you can have, at this level, preschool, 20 children, one teacher, and one aide. Ah, yes. Uh, with us, it's 25 uh, to a teacher and an aide of, of this age. In the state preschools, they have 20 children and one teacher and one aide always. Yes. Uh, well, it's not far, not far different to us. Of course, if you have more two and a half, so fewer four-year-olds, you do need an extra pair of hands because they need more help in everything, don't they? But then you, uh, in many schools, run with a, a volunteer mothers taking turns. Because it's this, uh, you know, it makes it very expensive if you can't have more adults to child. So there's nearly always one person who can mother anybody who's not happy or will be there to help pick up and so on. Now, the, the children should also know, uh, you can tell them when they come and visit you, or you can tell them as one of the first things when you have the group together, what is going to happen, you see, it, uh, just how long they will be with you. It's very important to tell them the time that their mother is coming for them, so they do know they will be fetched. But to tell them when they're going to have uh, mid-morning snack if you have one. Tell them when they're going out to play in the yard and things like this. They like to know the rough timetable. Particularly they like to know when they're going to be fetched. If they're going to be there with you all day, you tell them about the dinner, what they'll be having. They like to discuss the menu and you know, when how, what the rest is going to be like. Because with us, all children have this rest with a pillow and a blanket on the floor. And it's the time you want to play soft music for them. But they, the children up to about six need to be off their feet for at least 20 minutes, half an hour. In the middle of the day, the bones aren't completely ossified. And the doctors are saying a lot of the flat feet, not knees, and so on, are because the children are never running about without this sort of rest off the feet. So with us, it's a habitual for every school to give them this half hour's rest. Some people fall asleep, some people, most people don't. You know? And that's a good time to have soft music, something like that for them to listen to. Or you can let each child have something while he's lying down, a book or something. They lie very quiet in that time. They don't talk. So just explain to them anything that's going to happen in the school day, so they are prepared for it. Then you do have to. Uh, most of the time is fairly free activity, but if the children are being taken as a group anywhere, then they do have to always be taken really safely. And so from the beginning. If you have to take them upstairs or if you have to take them along a corridor to get to the playground, it's then that they have to form a line and keep in their right place. And they can't push and shove and just rush because then, then you would have accidents. 
they're going upstairs, our little ones have to come up one floor, you see, before they can get out into our playground. So they are trained from the beginning to go up the stairs, one adult in front and one adult behind. But every child has one hand on the banisters. And you have to be very firm about these things so that there's, you couldn't possibly push or shove on the stairs. So it, uh, there are these times when you have to have this real discipline. So if they, you may have to practice this with them. And then after that, if anyone does push on the stairs, then you all go back again and start again. Because they have to really understand safety regulations. But uh, they will enjoy practicing walking along in a line. We also take ours across the road because we have a very beautiful park and flowers and things, lots of grass and to run on. And if we go far enough, a very good children's playground. And if we're taking them out on the street in England, the children learn to walk on a rope. I don't know if they do here. You have a long rope, and every child has to hold on to the rope and with one hand and you, if, you always have the children on the inside from the traffic, so the rope is nearer the traffic side. And they mustn't uh, move out of position, and they mustn't let go of the rope. And then there's one adult behind. See, if you have a child who is at all, uh, you're in, in, unsure of his behavior in any way, then he always holds the hand of the adult. So there couldn't possibly be any accident walking along. Of course, with us, it's a very busy road, buses, and traffic, and so on. But they have to practice this, and you can't take them until you know that every child is really going to observe that safety regulation. But that is the easiest way of taking a group of small children out. And then the, uh, the playground. I don't think we've dis uh, have we discussed the playground. Yes. So. Yeah, the playground is very safe. They will probably spend more time. It's a good day you spend as much time outdoors as possible because they do love to play with them. Well, approximately, that's the sort of way you run your first day. And very soon, all the children will have made a good relationship with you, you see. Uh, they know you, they like you, and uh, life. Uh, these exercises, they're moving more quietly, they've made uh, social contacts with other children, probably made special friends. There are quite a lot of things they like to do and which they're helping themselves to. The practical life exercises have been introduced or the pegboard, they help themselves to it. And from the first day, you encourage them to put the things away where you're going to keep them. See? And, before you leave the schoolroom, you say, let's look around and see if our schoolroom looks really nice. Or oh. yeah. perhaps everyone can put their chair by their table. So, oh, there's some pegs. Do you think we could pick up those pegs? You see. Of course, uh, it takes time before they leave the room, really tidy, but you begin to get them to help you with this uh, leaving the room looking nice. And then you will find very soon, perhaps a week, perhaps a little longer if you're not so used to it, your children are coming in in the morning, and they come at different times, you know. It's sort of whenever the mothers drop them in, they just come straight into the schoolroom, and they greet you, and they walk around and talk to each other, and then they settle down to whatever they want to do. And then you have time begin bringing in the Montessori materials. You see, you notice your children. You would first, for the first lesson you give for something, you would choose a child who was fairly orderly, who had this ability to concentrate, who enjoyed starting new things, you see. Uh, and you would possibly bring in one of the cylinders and you would give him this meticulous lesson. At first, you will find that you bring in something new like that, and the other children will, or some of them, will come and crowd round and watch. And that's all right. Just smile at them, they can stand and watch. And when you finish the lesson, 
you make it clear that the piece of material is for the child you've been teaching, and that when he's finished with it, you will show them they can have it. And uh, that is the uh, rule always, that when you introduce anything, it's for the child you give the lesson to. Now, there are always exceptions. You may have an emotionally disturbed child who simply cannot wait for things, you see. In which case, you will find that the normalized child is always willing to give up, you see. And that is, again, uh, good thing. I mean, we need to learn this form of moral behavior. The children seem to know when there's one child who simply is not yet normalized, who simply can't, who, and they are very good about giving up. Or you could say to them, even, you can even say to a child, well, I'm afraid Jimmy hasn't learned to wait yet. He will learn. Perhaps you wouldn't mind letting him have it first. And uh, they were nearly always, of course, if they say no, they won't, and they're equally strong, <laughs> well, you, you give up. <laughs> uh, well, once you have brought anything into the classroom, that is kept on one of the shelves where it's always going to be kept. See? And any child who wants it, you will show them how to use it. So after this, you find yourself bringing in material fairly quickly and introducing it, different pieces every morning, giving individual lessons to different children. And basically, before long, you have brought in all the equipment for this age group, practical life, the, the sensorial materials. And if you have four-year-olds, four perhaps at the beginning of the math or the reading, see? So your children now are coming in and being able to choose their work. Well, now you do begin to remove all those extra things that you had just for the beginning of class. You begin to remove some of the things that you uh, well, are going to uh, keep for the children for when there's a wet day, or when, when the morning doesn't uh, go properly. You see. So you can gradually remove those things into a stock cupboard, and the children will spend longer and longer but always, uh, you have something ready in case you have one of those bad mornings. And at the end of many mornings, uh, you ha do have a short group lesson, singing, music, music and movement, uh, perhaps something in the form of art or handwork, uh, perhaps a, a nature uh, lesson with illustrations, and so on. So you often finish <coughs> off the morning with some group activity. Uh, I think, for the most part, handwork and art, and these things are done as a group. If you have your children all day, then you always have some interesting group activity in the afternoon. But the children are always free to leave the group activity everybody else is painting and you don't want to paint, there's no reason why you should. Or if everybody is uh, having a nature lesson and you feel like taking the scissors and cutting out, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't, or you prefer to use the cylinders. So yeah, the group lessons are not forced. And then if it's something like music and movement or singing, music and movement, you will always have some children who don't join in at first. See? Well, you don't have to over-persuade them. See? They can have a chair and sit and watch, See? often will do. And uh, these are the children, I think I said before, I often find that they like to watch everything and know what's going to happen. And when they feel familiar with it, then they join in. And they usually join in at a higher level because they really know what to do before they join. It's often intelligent children. Can be a, a shy child, but it's often an intelligent child. And you have to judge the right moment when you say, oh, take my hand and come and do it with me. Or give them, you know, a little final encouragement to join. You don't have to leave them sitting there forever. 
because some children need a little fun or poke. All right then, is there anything else? I think that's really what you would do. Is there anything you'd like to ask about it? What was the time limit again when you had the outburst of crying two to two weeks? Yeah, I've found roughly ten days to two weeks. Have, have you noticed it or you haven't had this age? I haven't had that age. Yes. Of course, if you were, I'm talking about the children two and a half to five. I'm not talking about the five-year-olds. You wouldn't have it. You wouldn't necessarily do all this for five-year-olds. They're much older. But then you will go in, straight into a work program. Anyone else? What's the time period of a normal morning? Would it be like 9 to 12, 3 hours? In England, it's usually 9 to 12, 30. You see? And remember, the mothers bring them at varying times. So although you're open at 9, I mean, sometimes fathers drop the children on the way to work, so they may come at half past 8 or quarter to 9. And some children may not arrive till half past 9. That first hour seems so you know, be coming and going to a certain extent. But if the mothers just drop them at the door, that doesn't matter. And then the today is this pre-work. You don't start with group lessons. You have this free period when the children probably wander about and talk to each other and feed the fish and so on, and then settle to work their own choosing. And every child takes a rest period when he's ready to some break after a very short spell of activity and some work for a longer period. And then you'll get children wandering around the room and doing nothing. And don't, uh, well, you don't want to rush them into another occupation. They need that sort of breathing spell. And very, then they usually go back to something else. And the second uh, period of activity lasts much longer than the first. Now I think in many Montessori schools, when the children begin to have that first rest period, the teacher thinks the work is over for the morning and she's inclined then to have a snack and um, then group lessons, but she hasn't allowed for the second work period, you see, which is lasts longer than the first and may go on practically the whole morning. So I never have a snack break. I think it's a terrific waste of time. I think all this handing round of snack and sitting there in groups. If, if you're going to have anything, the children are better having nothing to eat for four hours between meals. They're all being, most children are being overfed. And even for one slice of apple, you produce all your digestive juices, you see. So then when the meal comes, you can't produce another set of digestive juices and you don't want the meal. So. Personally, I, all these snacks I used to give the children for after lunch. After they would eaten their dinner, then they could have a lovely time sharing their snacks. Water was always there. But if you're going to have it, then I would have it at the end of a room on the table. Any child could go there and sit down and eat or drink when he wanted to. How do you manage going outside? Uh, sometimes after... There's an edge of this outside. Well, that's what I say. I think you have to, unless your room opens onto the garden, you have to take the children in an orderly fashion. Okay, assuming it does open onto the garden, how would you manage it then? Well, the, that is up to you. If your room really opens onto the garden, perhaps you, uh, in England, we might just have free access. But if you did that, you would have to have someone in the playground. See, otherwise, you would all go out at the same time. It sort of catches on once one child goes out, the next observes and wants to go out. Well, no, if you're all going out together, you, the teacher, decide when it's time. See? And then you get everybody to put their things away, leave the schoolroom tidy. And then, of course, if it's winter, you have all these clothes to put on. What if it's after, say, a summer break, where the children have been out of school for about two months, and they have a few new ones coming in? Then you 
probably can go straight into your normal routine. And the children coming back after the summer break, they just pick up from where they were. They're thrilled to see each other, they see their friends, they see the materials, and you have time for the few new ones. You see. You don't, unless most of your children, unless about half of your children are new, you wouldn't have to have this routine. And then you would have it, and probably your old children would want some of the things they were used to. They would know the practical life things. You, then you might, it wouldn't take you so long, but you might have this for a few days. Can you tell them that you're going to take the beads and the string thread out of the room? Would you let them know it's going to be out of the room? Uh, well, you, not necessarily. You can't keep telling them things, can you? I just wanted to you can tell them. Uh, I, I, you don't really need to. If they ask for them, you say, oh, well, I've got those in my cupboard, and we're going to use them on wet days. You, you can't, if you've got a dozen different toys, you can't say when everything's going to disappear. Say, oh, we'll have leg on. If they ask for it, you say, oh, well, that's in my cupboard. We have that on the wet day. No, I don't think we have to warm it. If they persist and they really want those beads to string, would you bring them back? You can decide that yourself. Okay. <laughs> you know your children. You know. You can't, you know, you can't underline everything because. All right, then. And next time, you'll all have your questions. Any aspects of the matter?